I am really excited to uh, uh, introduce Drew Hoskins, who is a um, staff engineer at Stripe. And um, uh, I think Stripe is known as being a great engineering organization and uh, produces such an incredibly broad portfolio of uh, services and products. And uh, uh, that's only made possible because of the platforms and the environment that they provide their engineers. Um, and Drew is an exceptionally thoughtful person that's been working on developer experience and engineering technology uh, at Stripe and in years before. Uh, and he is going to give a really excellent talk on keeping workflow developers afloat. So I'd like to introduce Drew Hoskins. Hey, everybody. I did rename my talk in light of a recent events in the form of going around the North Atlantic in a boat for a couple weeks. And uh, so, yeah, let's get going. So temporal is a paradigm shift for distributed systems. And we, as a community, are still working on learning how to use it best. And so my goal for this talk is just to accelerate the process of figuring out what this temporal thing is and helping us all use it better. Um, I just do want to say I'm a little salty for my, my time slot today because I think now I know that if I had gone first, I would have gotten recruiting love from Ryan for Stripe instead of Datadog. So, you know, and also I know I'm the only person standing between you and lunch. So I hope this is going to go okay. Okay. So, yeah, I was in Scoresby Sound, Greenland. I'll talk a little bit about that because I know you came here for my vacation slides. And then uh, I'll talk a bit of context about Stripe, our history, how we got into Temporal, why we wrapped the Temporal SDK, and maybe help you think about whether you should do that. And then uh, pervasive best practices. So we're learning what we need to do as a community, and we need to scale out to more and more people who know how to do those things that, that we're learning as we sort of go along here. As, and so, and then I'll recap at the end. So this is, uh, this is where I was in Scoresby Sound. It's beautiful, and I highly recommend going if you can. It's one of only two towns on the east coast of Greenland, or it, and it's just a beautiful sound with lots of, well, icebergs. Nobody ever told me how awesome icebergs are. There are so many varieties of textures and shapes, and there's also a lot going on underneath the surface with icebergs. You can see, and it's just gorgeous. And uh, this iceberg in the middle here is interesting. You can see these water lines. And the, the reason is because icebergs have a lot of volatility. So as they melt, the center of gravity shifts. And then the water line, and it'll capsize. And then there's a new water line, which will change the melting patterns. And so um, no point in this slide, just it's cool. Um, <laughs> But you don't want to get too close to icebergs. They're incredibly dense. They're formed over s decades of, like, on Greenland, like, the snow compacts the ice and it makes it really, really dense. And then they calve off of the glaciers and go into the ocean. And so you do not want to hit them. But if you're an inflatable rubber boat, you're kind of OK, because you'll just bounce off. And so if you're in a field of icebergs, you can kind of putter through them. Uh, one zodiac popularized the inflatable boat, uh, then it, it grew into many different applications, tourism, military, all kinds of things. And, and so it was a paradigm shift for boating. And well, here's the tortured metaphor time. <laughs> um, temporal is the inflatable boat, and we can zip around the icebergs. Now, we still do want to avoid the icebergs. They are, they are volatile and they shift around, and so you don't want to just run into them willy-nilly, but being in such a boat, you can move around with more confidence. And uh, I love this iceberg. It looks like gravity is like optional for this iceberg, like these floating stones. It's amazing. OK, so yes, uh, Temporal is versatile, resilient, and, uh, and it's, it's going to help us navigate a minefield of, of distributed systems problems. OK, so let's talk about Stripe. What did we do? Uh, so I'm, I'm on a team called Workflow Engine. We, I founded the team around 
let's see, beginning of 2021. And we now support over 80 namespace, temporal namespaces, which is roughly equivalent to like a team or a project uh, because you, we have people create a new namespace for every different project. And uh, we have both infrastructure customers who tend to write things like control planes and product customers who write like money movement and compliance audits and who knows, all kinds of things. So we've now kind of reached the point where we can keep all of the use cases for our system in our heads and now it's just like, oh yeah, who knows what people are doing these days. Our top priority is, so we went breadth first at Stripe. So we didn't, I think at a lot of companies, they come in and they've got one use case they want to use Temporal for, and then other teams are like, ooh, what's that? At Stripe, we, from the very beginning, said, we see a lot of different things where we think this would be useful. We're just going to build it for uh, lots of people. And so I'm a really big fan of this strategy because it meant that we could, the, the early adopters would sort of self-select and they would use it, they would be willing to take a risk on a newer technology and we wouldn't have to like scale to payments, Stripe payment scale at the beginning. Um, and so we could um, just do a great job of the developer experience and then later on deal with some of the really hard problems. We think of reliability a little bit more expansively than I think a lot of other teams. Of course, we got to keep the infrastructure running and reliable, but we also take it personally when our users make mistakes. And we'll like, if they have an incident, we will, that's self-inflicted, maybe they have a versioning problem. Um, then we think, what could we have done to help them prevent, to not make that mistake in the first place? And these two things are very related. You know, with a system like Temporal, if people feel safe, then they can move fast. And it, just in the same way that like, if you're in a Zodiac and you can, you can go really fast and you, can, you have a rubber edge, you can go over that little iceberg that doesn't look too threatening and you'll be fine. So, the workflow engine at Stripe um, is a pretty large system by this point, and it's getting larger. We have lots to do. It's, uh, Stripe has a service-oriented architecture, and so we, our users own their own workers, which are the things that pull Temporal and they do work. And we provide them like a script to set up a new worker, and we provide scaffolding for them to do monitoring so they can set up all their alerts. And, and then there's pieces that we own, namely Temporal itself. We own the server and uh, Elasticsearch and uh, a proxy server. We also fully wrapped the Java and Ruby SDKs in our own abstractions. I'll talk about that later. And then on, on the Go side, we have a lot of infra teams using Go, and we didn't, wrap, we didn't have time yet to wrap that SDK, and so they're using the uh, lightly extended Go SDK. Uh, we've also built a management plane and user interface which, here's a screenshot of that. Uh, what is this? Well, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, there's a link out to Temporal Web, which is Temporal's built-in interface for operations. Really useful, you can debug workflows, you can list workflows. But we wanted to extend it because we wanted to provide uh, links to documentation, dashboards, logs, as well as some bells and whistles like the ability to start a workflow from the UI. All right, so that's a bit about Stripe's context. Now I want to talk about uh, why, like our history. Why did we wrap the Temporal SDK in our own activity and workflow abstractions? So we started out using Temporal Ruby. And Temporal Ruby is an open source. It's not an officially sanctioned SDK from Temporal. It's something that the community built, uh, namely the Coinbase. And we were new to Temporal. I personally had not, never used it before. I wasn't confident. And um, we knew we wanted to build sorbet types. And if you don't know what sorbet is, uh, sorbet is to Ruby as TypeScript is to JavaScript. So it adds strong typing onto an untyped language. And uh, we also wanted to be able to hide foot guns. Like we, which is, I don't know if that's Stripe jargon or industry jargon at this point, but. Uh, we didn't necessarily trust the entire interface. We didn't know anything about Temporal, and uh, well, we knew a little bit, but we didn't, we didn't necessarily want to expose the, the full breadth of what Temporal offers to our customers. We wanted to have more control over the experience. And like Coinbase had built it, but like, do I need to believe in Bitcoin to like trust this SDK? I'm not really sure. So everything just felt a little scary. Um, 
And, uh, and there were a few other things we wanted to do. So we wanted to provide actionable error messages. This is a, a big obsession of mine. We wanted to be able to take exceptions that Temporal might throw and then wrap them in Stripe specific like, hey, go to this URL to resolve your problem or, or do these, you know, run this script that we have built internally. So, um, and then finally, like one of the other nice things that we do, wanted to do is like give them a, a, a when, when you create a workflow and you get uh, the response back, you'll get a URL which tells you where to go to debug that workflow. Uh, and that's something that like Temporal could never provide but Stripe could provide. So just a few things. We've done a whole ton of things with our wrappers, but the rule of three was satisfied. The rule of three is like, if you can think of three really compelling things to do with a new abstraction that are separate, then go, then go build that thing. And we had a bunch of ideas for what we would do if we had a wrapper, and so that's what we went and did it. And then later on, we then built our Java SDK out, and we took the same approach for similar reasons. We were also able to improve type safety in the Java SDK, although to a lesser degree. And, uh, and the good news about the Java SDK was there had, they had some really nice extensibility mechanisms. I want to just tell you about a couple of those, just to, you know, you don't have to understand everything about them, but just to tease you about the kinds of power that the temporal SDK offers. So a dynamic workflow is something in the temporal SDK. I believe it's available for Go as well as Java. And it, you can think of it as a router. You get a request to say start a workflow in your, into your SDK. And then you just sort of route it to whatever, you could just parse it and route it to whatever class that you want to route it to. And so we route it to our own version of workflows. We also have built an abstraction called task, which is like the easy sauce version of a workflow. It's like one activity workflow where you just have to write one class rather than both a workflow and an activity. They also have this cool thing called interceptors. Uh, this particular interceptor is intercepting an activity call and getting the response back. And before we, get the, we, before we give the response back, we want to log whether or not the activity call succeeded. And in this specific code example, I'm taking a, a poll failure and saying that's, n like, that's not a failure because polling failures are expected as a general course of business. And so I'm going to log a failure or a success uh, based on whether there's an exception. Interceptors are also great for doing any kind of validations. So overall, uh, you know, if you are a platform team and you're adopting the, the Temporal SDK on behalf of your company, you've got you know, 10 plus teams that are gonna be using it, I, I do think you should consider wrapping the core abstractions. You don't have to do it all at once. You can just incrementally say, I'm gonna wrap activities or, or whatever you wanna do. Uh, we have found that it gave us higher upfront cost but lower support costs over time. And the reason we, we know that is we did an unintentional experiment where we had our infrastructure users using the Go SDK, which was unwrapped, and we had our product users using the Java and Ruby SDKs, which were wrapped. And we found we could see the kinds of questions and problems that our Go customers were running into that our Ruby and Java customers were not. Um, and so it was, it was really interesting to see the different kinds of, of, uh, of feedback we were getting. Okay, so pervasive best practices. So again, in this section, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of best practices, I'll call, uh, and some are gonna be easier to build than others. I think, I, I'm hoping that this piece will be useful to a lot of folks. I try to include a variety of things that you could build really cheaply, but some, some more expensive, and then if you aren't a platform team, there'll still be some best practices here that you can learn, even if you don't have time to sort of encode them at a deeper level. And finally, I think hopefully some of these concepts can get brought into the open source uh, code bases over time. Timeouts are one of the most prolific sources of problems for temporal and just and in general tempor uh, distributed systems developers. So I'm gonna talk about a bunch of like bad scenarios which are, I call icebergs and talk about the best practices that would either mitigate or solve those problems. So one question that we received commonly is like, why has my workflow been stuck for hours? They, they would look at their workflow history, they would just be like, it's not running, what's happening? And the answer was, well, it's, you've set a really long timeout on your activity 
and if you and Temporal doesn't know that it can retry the activity and your activity maybe your worker failed or something and so you can either set your timeout shorter or you can heartbeat to tell Temporal hey, I'm still alive I'm still and then therefore Temporal can know in a shorter period of time whether to retry okay another common one uh, we early on we had uh, a lot of workflows that were failing because one activity took too long to start and the reason for that was we were using a 10 second schedule to start timeout as our default and that meant if the activity hadn't started it had queued up for 10 seconds or more it would just fail and the so this was actually the default in temporal ruby at the time uh, which has uh, by the way Jokes about Coinbase aside, no, it is actually quite a good. We've been really pleased with the SDK, and and there's been a lot of great uh, contributions by them and by us and others since then. And so, I don't I don't mean to cast doubt on that SDK. And actually, I believe um, we're looking forward to an officially sanctioned Ruby SDK uh, in 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so let's see what else. So we, we turned off schedule to start timeouts, and in fact, we, uh, we just monitor now. If, if queues are getting long, we, we monitor. And uh, we don't even expose the ability to set those timeouts to our users, and nobody has asked for them yet. OK. So another thing that we would see is people would write uh, workflows, and they'd set a 30-minute timeout very reasonably. But then there would be a bug, and then the workflow would get stuck, and it would time out. And now they'd have these failed workflows and they'd have to use TCTL to go like restart the workflows or, or create new ones or, or whatever, write scripts to create new ones. And the solution here is just to use really long workflow timeouts. We, we default to three weeks. It's a little bit arbitrary, but uh, it gives people time to deploy code fixes. Users have told us during incidents where they were able to do this, where they could just deploy the code fix, and then all the workflows that were in retry loops would just keep retrying, and then magically they would continue. They loved it, and they were just surprised at how easy it was to fix ongoing issues in production. It's counterintuitive to choose a timeout that has nothing to do with the code that's running in the workflow. It's all about the human dynamics of how to correct the workflow when it's stuck, and nothing about the actual code that's running in it. We'll talk later about what we need to do to make these long timeouts work in practice. There's a few other things that you want to do. So how do we encode these best practices that we learned into the framework? Well, first of all, I want to start by saying that activities at, at Stripe provide their own timeouts and retry policies, whereas in Temporal, typically the caller of the activity will pass in those things. And the reason we did this is because, especially at a larger company like Stripe, but really at any kind of company, the person who's calling the activity is not the same person as the person who writes it. So for example, it might be a shared activity like send a Slack message that someone, some author wrote uh, that, um, that the caller, there's many callers. Or it could be a cross namespace call to uh, some, something that somebody else wrote. And so, we think that the author of the activity is the person who's the expert, and therefore should be the one who specifies the default retry policies. And so, uh, or sorry, timeouts. Retry policies come later. Uh, and so we then, because we've got these static declarations of retry policies, we can just loop over all of the activities that you register and check, and do, and, and check them for sanity. And so, in fact, a lot of our validations are what I would call heuristics. It's like, well, we're pretty sure this is a bad idea, but we don't know for sure. It, you're, it's up to you. And so we'll give an, an error that you can ignore if you want to ignore it. And so, for example, this one is just saying, look, you've got a really long act timeout on your activity. Uh, maybe just double check that that's the right approach. For example, in the website, in the web page that is linked to in this error message, we suggest the polling pattern where instead of sleeping in a loop, inside of their activity, they let Temporal much more efficiently do the sleeping and use its retry policy to exponentially back off, rather than them building exponential back off themselves and sleeping and taking up a lot of resources. So these, we use these little nudges to like say, hey, here's this area that you may not have thought about, maybe reconsider. Retries, 
another very common source of icebergs. So going back to the money movement example from earlier, uh, an activity that moves money, and then let's say it succeeds, but it doesn't ever get to tell Temporal that it succeeded because of a network partition. And so then it's going to rerun, and it might move money twice. And so the best practice is therefore to make the, the activity idempotent, and so that if it's rerun, it's not going to resend the money. And this could be done, for example, by having a unique identifier for the money movement that we can check and see if that money movement has already happened. Temporal actually has a, if you need a primer on idempotency, Temporal has a great video up on YouTube talking about it. Um, similarly, if a cluster goes down and we, need to we have a workflow that's in the middle of running and we need to fail it over to another cluster, um, how do we trust, uh, how can we trust to start running that again? What if we you know, have a workflow history and we're going to start from the end of that workflow history, but because there was an outage, we don't trust that workflow history to be current. Maybe some things happened that we never got the memo on. So the answer is, again, if you made all of your activities in your workflow item potent, then they can be run, rerun safely and, um, and there's, there's, no, there's no risk. You can be very aggressive about just running them in the new cluster. So how do we get developers to think about idempotency? It's like a classic blunder, right? Like, I write some code that's not idempotent. It's just like, you know, I'm sure thousands of times a day, some developer somewhere has written something that wasn't idempotent but should have been. So the first thing we do is we ask activity creators to choose their strategy of at least once or at most once execution. And just making them choose this gets them thinking about idempotency and thinking about, oh, I don't have exactly once semantics that I could rely on um, in synchronous code. And we can, now that we have this bit of information, yeah, you know, at least once, at most once, as a framework, we now have the data we need to do more powerful things. So for example, we can give them a default sensible retry policy if they have executed at least once, and we can test them for item potency. So what we do is if anybody writes an integration test of a workflow, every time they run an activity, we actually behind the scenes run that activity a second time and we compare the results of the two runs. And if they're different, then we will flag it. Uh, we, we, or if there's an exception in one and not the other, then we'll flag that. And, uh, and that catches, that's caught a lot of issues. It doesn't catch every item potency issue, of course, but it just catches some of them. Okay. So earlier we talked about workflow timeouts, which was how long workflows can take. But there's this other concept we need. How long should the workflow take? How long are my customers expecting this workflow? I'm betting they need it more than three, in sooner than three weeks. So that's what we'll talk about in this section. So one iceberg is a, a, a workflow encounters a transient failure in some other service. And so, what we'll do here is we will track failure metrics and alert if, uh, if the number of transient failures gets too high. Because after all, the point of temporal is to deal with gracefully with transient failures. So we don't want to ping developers every time such a thing happens. What if there's an extended outage? Well, at some point, transient failure becomes an extended outage. When is that threshold? Well, the threshold is the SLA that you've defined. So if you said my SLA is an hour, then transient becomes extended when that SLA is breached. And so we need an additional way to notify developers when there's an alert, when there's a, the SLA is breached. What if there's a code bug? What if I've got an invalid argument to an activity inside my workflow? And uh, no amount of like retries is ever going to fix that. Should I just fail the workflow? Well, actually, that's not what we do. We also, we will, you know, track metrics and we will surface those metrics early to the, de to the developer. But those things tend to, we have found that those developers tend to ignore those things because they're not sure um, if it's like really critical or not. Because again, temporal makes a lot of things uh, go away. And so we need an additional alert when the SLA is breached to say, hey, like this is really, really bad now. Um, I'm, we're going to page you. 
And, uh, and again, because of that magic, the magic of um, letting the developer like just deploy a code fix to fix the work, running workflow, we don't fail the workflow when even a seemingly fatal error occurs, like an, like an invalid argument. So here's what it looks like. This is actually some Ruby code. Uh, this is a, a configuration on a workflow. This workflow is scheduled to run once a day, and it should take at most an hour. And if it doesn't uh, run within that hour, it's going to notify the team. The team provided Slack channel saying that this workflow was out of SLA. And it's going to give them a, a, a link to a runbook, which is Stripe's term for just like guides for how to re resolve incidents that might be happening so that they have specified this. And so it might have some advice for this specific workflow and how to fix it. And then behind the scenes, we set up a timer on their workflow that runs in parallel to their workflow. And after an hour, it fires and it sends a notification. And so in this case, let's say there's an activity stuck in a retry loop, then they get the notification, they go deploy the fix to the code, and then the workflow will, will complete. But we're not done. That notification is, very, is good for like a small number of workflows. But what if like, you've got a ton of workflows that got stuck after a bad deploy? You can't fix it with a code fix, and uh, how do you remediate them? Well, you can search for workflows that are out of SLA, and then you can terminate them or reset them or do whatever thing. So be able to search for them, we need some sort of search attribute, uh, which we put into Elasticsearch so that you can query for all of your, your stuck workflows. And, uh, and so the query is like, uh, so what we do when we create a workflow is we set an out of SLA time. Like in, if it's in one hour, this workflow will go out of SLA. So we put that timestamp on the workflow. And then later on, if there is an incident, I can query for all the workflows that their SLA time is before now that are still running. And I know uh, then I can loop over those and or do some sort of batch operation on them. And then we have a checker where we will, we're building this, but we will have a checker that, uh, that, loop, that uh, looks for these and then pages teams when they have a whole bunch of, like they can set the threshold for like, how many workflows do I need to be out of SLA before I page you and, and so forth. And should I page or open a JIRA ticket or, or whatever, we'll have those, those functionality. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about today is, uh, is batching. So um, batches are a large percentage of workflows at Stripe and workflows, and so, but, but customers, and, and, and Temporal has all the primitives that you need to write batch jobs, but, uh, but it's a little hard to figure them out. And so we would love to, to add sort of special, we're, we're, we're trying to add special support for batches and uh, wanna engage the community on this one. So typically like we use batch jobs at Stripe when we have a bunch of work to do but it's too expensive to create one workflow per item and so instead we're gonna like loop over a bunch of items and uh, maybe in, inside of an activity and, and process them that way. So here's an example, this is the sort of pre-inflatable votes version of batch migration. This is what you would have written in a pre-temporal type of uh, system. So this one uh, just does a tipple, simple loop. It's gonna get the next batch, maybe querying the database for the next batch, maybe 50 items, loop through those items and do an operation, and then move on to the next, uh, keep a cursor, say, and then query the database on the next iteration with the next cursor. What are some problems, what are some icebergs we can run into when we do that? Well, what if it's taking a long time? How do I know if it's even still making progress? What if it's stuck on something or what if it failed? Well, the answer with Temporal is you can send activity heartbeats. And that tells Temporal, hey, I'm still making progress. Every time through the loop, I'm sending a heartbeat. So I know that progress is being made. But what if it, it does need to retry, the, what if there is a failure and it does need to retry the, the activity, but maybe my database is flaky, maybe it's failing right now, one every hundred requests. And so then I keep trying to make, I, but every time I restart the activity, I go from the beginning and I try to, and I never, I never actually get to the end. 
Well, the best practice would be to send temporal a cursor uh, with the heartbeat. So temporal can keep track of where you are for you. And then when you resume the activity, you start from the cur cursor. So let's show what that looks like. It's actually quite easy if you know what to do. Um, so you start from your activity, you pull a cursor out, and notice this, get, this context is something that Temporal provides. And they have this concept called last heartbeat, uh, which is any data that you provided in the last heartbeat. And so you're sort of bootstrapping your activity with that, with that cursor. Then you do your loop as normal, and every time you heartbeat, you pass in the cursor to, to it. But we're not done. There's other fancy and hard things with batches. So let's say you're processing in a bunch of things in parallel. So you've fanned out to a bunch of different activities. But you've got hundreds, thousands of activities that you need to run. Um, your workflow history then grows very long. And thank you, Jacob, for sort of talking about history so I can just sort of gloss over it. But basically, temporal really slows bogs down when you get very long histories. And so the answer in batch jobs is you have to periodically continue as new or use child workflows so that you're dividing up your work among different workflows uh, so that no one workflow's history gets too long. Um, what if you need to limit the number of simultaneous connections to another service? We had this customer come and talk to us and they said, we have to have at most 10 requests to this third party's API at any time if we go over that, they'll charge us like triple. And so we built for them this queue, which kind of like go, gets all the activities ready and it just dispatches 10 at a time. And when one of them uh, gets finished, then we, pull, we, we, we execute the next one. And so long story short, batching is tricky. There's a lot to think about, especially as you scale up your batching. And so we are working on a higher level abstraction f that's specifically for batches. And it's built with workflow activities because again, Temporal provides everything we need. We just need to package it a little bit better so that people can focus more on their business logic and less on the sort of mechanics of running batches. And we're in early design here, so we, if anybody else is interested in this area, please, please reach out. Okay, ha, that was a lot. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, just to recap, I think we, you know, we, I do recommend thinking about if, if you're a platform team, wrapping the SDKs partially or fully, figuring out what the, the most leveraged places for you to assert your um, opinions and, and do those. We've had very strong adoption and good feedback. Uh, we've had a lot of, again, we had a breadth first strategy, so we have lots and lots of use cases. We're now getting into where the, the more conservative teams at Stripe, the higher scale teams are coming to us looking for solutions. And so we're working on scale and other really like harder problems at this point, as well as continuing to make breadth plays like uh, for batching. Um, our goal throughout has been to create pits of success for our customers so that they just sort of naturally fall into using the right patterns. And I'm also really excited about some of the the open source future for some of these. Ryland mentioned to me yesterday that the execute at most once versus at least once dichotomy is, is going to make itself in its way into the open source. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm hoping that some of these other things we can help out with in the community. Okay. Um, we're hiring. <laughs> I'm not as, as good of a sales pitcher as, as Ryan about th such things, but um, you know. Hopefully, you are excited anyway. And yeah, find me in Temporal Slack, email, LinkedIn. I'm happy. I, I, I'll talk about these things till I'm hoarse. So just come reach out to me or find me in the hallway. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Do you have time for one or two questions before lunch? Yeah, sure. So the first question that I thought was um, uh, that someone queued off on is you talked about this idea of a, of a task, this, this uh, kind of a single activity workflow wrapped up into one. So the first question, which was from the audience, and I've got a follow on, was um, how, what percentage of your workflows in a given day or week look like that versus ones that are more complex? And also, what is, what's the high watermark for complex maybe as a contrast? Yeah, absolutely. So what tasks are, just to give a brief outline, is 
they're, they quack like activities and they quack like workflows. So it's one class that you implement. You can call it as an activity from within a workflow or you can call it as a workflow. And this gives people an up, when they, they've got a product and they start out very simple, they've just got one step. Uh, they, they start with attack, but then we've made sure it's upgradable very easily into a workflow as their thing becomes more complex. Mm. And so we actually just launched, I think we launched it maybe three months ago, something is very recent. We've already had 25 tasks authored. Mm. So it's been really, and, and this is just Java. We haven't done it in Ruby yet. Okay. Um, and so it's already a sizable portion of our overall, uh, like. So it's a minority today, but it's also so new that it's it might be it might become a majority in the future. Yeah, it may actually be a majority of the of the last three months mm -hmm. in Java. And what about the opposite side? If you think about like what's the what's the most uh, sophisticated or complex implementations on the opposite extreme? What do these grow into that you've seen so far? Oh, I mean, we haven't had time to see tasks grow, but we have seen... No, but more like a, like a workflow with many, many activities. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, so we have... Um, so our Connect team uses a workflow to, uh, to, do, to do batching. They, they have a user-triggered uh, migrations, and the users get, like, they get a progress bar to track how the migration is doing. They can stop it, um, pause it halfway, and so they've... They've used really the full extent of Temporal's built-in batching primitives mm -hmm. to really give like end users control over those those batches. So that's one of the more interesting ones. But there's so many. I mean, there's a lot. Right on. Uh, okay, another question. Um, let me get this correct. How do you okay? How do you ramp up other teams at Stripe uh, on temporal concepts? Like you kind of talked about all these patterns and best practices and anti-patterns. Uh, what's, how does someone get introduced to Temporal now if they're working on Stripe? Yeah. I, I gave a talk and so we, uh, at, at Stripe about Temporal, and this is a common way for people to, to ramp up is by watching my talk, or in our talk, sorry, there were several of us talking. And then we, we do try to encode as much into the framework as possible, so we try to leave little breadcrumbs for people. And then we have a getting started guide. We also have this doc called the Classic Blunders, which is like a list of the like common pitfalls using Temporal, like how to make sure your workflows are pure and other types of stuff. And then we add lint rules for those types of things. So we have uh, error prone in Java and RuboCop and Ruby to sort of flag when people are doing little mistakes. Okay. All right, and last question. And then, and then again, like w the one last thing I would say is like, we have a script that, you, we have a, a UI you can go to service, provision a new service and it, the idea is like the metric we tracked in H1 for this is like time to QA. It's like how quickly can you get a worker into, into QA so that you can test out your workflow. And uh, this is under two hours right now. So it's actually pretty fast. Very cool. Uh, and then the, the one last question that somebody asked that I want to be good to wrap on. <clears throat> you have all these different productivity enhancements you've kind of provided to your internal teams. Uh, that kind of wrap around temporal or extend temporal. Of all the things you've done so far, what's been the highest payoff one? If there's like low hanging fruit, the one of these projects someone else could take on, what, what would you recommend? Uh, that is a great question. I, I reserve the right to be wrong on this, but I think timeouts. So, I mean, wrapping the SDK then gave us so much leverage to be able to be very creative about a number of things. And so I think, uh, but I, so we've done a bunch, but I think, I think timeouts comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Ida Potosi comes up a lot. So those are, are good ones to focus on. Um, this is, yeah. Wonderful. But I don't know. <laughs> right. it's a, it was a breath strategy. Same question as everybody else. Are you willing to share your slides? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. This has been excellent.